1. I come from a small town in southern Ontario, Canada. Every year my father and I try to take two weeks over the summer and rent a cabin up north. On the particular year this happened, I was about 17 years old and was working a full-time job in a factory. My father's job had delayed his vacation days posting, and I was still waiting for my time off to be approved, so he and I were getting dangerously close to the deadline of renting a cabin. We usually booked our cabins months in advance to ensure we got the best prices and the nicest locations with the most hiking trails and tourist attractions. This year, however, we basically had to rent a cabin on the hem of our pants. I finally got my vacation approval only two weeks before our holiday started. We lost hope after the fifth resort we called told us what we already knew we were going to hear. They were booked up for the summer. We stopped looking after the third day of racking up phone bills, making phone calls that ended in disappointment and anger. I had more than accepted that this would have to be the first year in five we had not taken a trip up north. I had no idea it would be our last, though. Surprisingly, my father called me on a Wednesday morning, telling me to pack my bags. We were due to be at a cabin in Bridgeview on Friday afternoon. Bridgeview, name has been changed, was a small town about seven hours north of my hometown, and a mere hour and a half from Sault Ste. Marie, which was the farthest north we had ever travelled. I was excited. I packed my bags, loaded up my car, and made the hour-long trip to my father's residence, so we could load up the new and improved 2007 Ford Mustang ragtop and make the journey together. The trip to Bridgeview was beautiful, but tiresome. Long open roads, straight as arrows, vast billowing fields of farmer's life work, and dark, rolling forests that seem to suck up the sun so its shadows may consume it. When we finally entered the very small town of Bridgeview, we were in awe of just how little it truly was. A single convenience store, gas station, sold overpriced cleaning supplies and snacks. This is important later. The residents smiled but never waved, seemingly wary of newcomers. I guess I should describe the ad my father responded to. The ad on Kijiji listed a cute little cabin with an add-on bedroom surrounded by woods. It was described to be a couple feet away from the crystal clear waterfront and a clean and welcoming atmosphere. The individuals who posted the ad claimed the cabin was available all summer, and my dad, being the pessimist he was, decided it must be a hidden gem that no one else discovered. To the willing heart, the ad made the cabin look gorgeous. Young wooden paneling, a newly built wraparound deck, indoor plumbing and electricity, high-end leather couches in the living room area, and plush, single and queen-size beds in the add-on and master bedroom. The kitchen had all the stained wooden cabinets with sparkling white appliances. The ad even advertised the fire stove heated hot tub besides the cabin that was free to use for renters. And a canoe that was set to be in near mint condition, safety vests and paddles included. The GPS obviously didn't recognize such a rural address back then, and it took us an additional 45 minutes of driving in and around the time before we finally found the hidden road we were supposed to take to our destination. The winding road snaked downhill through a plethora of spruce and oak saplings, shadowed by their ancient wooden guardians. The decline became steep as my father gingerly rode the brakes. He had specifically asked the ad holding, in his private message, if the path to the cabin was paved. As we did not have a vehicle that could handle any terrain other than flat. He assured us the drive was paved the entire way, and although the hill was steep and winding, it was relatively easy to navigate once she'd done it a few times. Granted, we were staying for two weeks. We'd figure between the two of us we would be able to get the car from point A to point B. To my father's dismay, the road's maintenance began to falter until the once smoothed asphalt had turned to a deep, loose gravel. My dad slowed the car to a near stop, then decided against it. 
he didn't want to get stuck and have to push the red beast out of the gravel that pulled at the tires like quicksand. We continued on our way. After about five minutes of slow cruising and the occasional curse muttered by my father, we arrived to a small clearing. The road we were on leveled out and turned to dirt before immediately careening down a steep incline into the water. A not so convenient place for a boat dock. Two young gentlemen with unwashed hair and bloodshot eyes greeted us at the cabin. They looked jittery, like they were resisting the urge to scratch a million mosquito bites all over their bodies. Their eyes drifted back and forth between my father and me before, quickly, snapping to the shiny Mustang sitting in the driveway. One of the men smiled as he nodded in its direction. Nice car, he said through yellow teeth. My father politely nodded. Thank you. Hey, didn't you say this road was paved all the way down? The man looked confused, still not taking his eyes off the car. He was still smiling, the smile now turning into more of a grimace, as he forced to keep it on his worn face. Did I say that? Sorry, guy. Must have slipped my mind. I've got a truck, you see. So used to coming down here. You have the money? My father found it a little odd that the cabin was to be paid in cash only. They wouldn't even accept a deposit check. Now that he saw the two men were probably in their mid to late twenties, he knew why. It was party money. My father nodded and gave the man a wad of bills. The second man, a little shorter with a protruding beer belly, an equivalent to that of a six-month pregnancy, and a dirty white tank top with a grimy brownish-red stain down the front, stared at the money with hungry eyes. The thinner man with the beard grabbed the money and turned on his heel to leave, before turning back with his finger pointing skyward, as if to state an ingenious hypothesis. Oh yeah, before I forget, the previous renters lost the keys to the cabin. Said they were in the lake somewhere. It's quiet out here, no one around for miles. No one will bother you. If you feel like locking the door, you'll have to reach your hand in through the window besides uh, the front door to unlock it when you come back. Look, we have removed the window panel here and pinned back the screen so you can get in, see? He shoved a dirty hand into the window beside the cabin door and locked and unlocked the door by hand. My father and I exchanged worried glances before the two men bounded off to the truck shouting something about having a safe trip as they ran past and sped off. In their haste, they sprayed gravel over the front deck of the cabin. We shrugged our shoulders, dismissing their overly juvenile minds, and headed towards the car to grab our few bags. We were told the cabin was fully furnished, and so we didn't bring much other than toiletries, clothes, and some personal items. Before we entered the cabin, we set our bags on the deck and did a 360-point inspection of the exterior. It was obvious to us that the pictures in the ad had been taken some years prior, when the cabin was well-maintained and new. Now the bright yellow lumber walls were a dingy, dying grey colour. The deck creaked with decay, and the supposed crystal-clear lake a few feet away was a murky orange lake of muck and it was about a three-minute walk down from a cliff to get to the beach below. The nearly mint-conditioned kayak lay on its side on the shore. Red paint had peeled off in places, making it look like an odd rendition of camel fashion. Dents lined the sides and the bottom of the kayak, and we wondered if the damn thing would even stay afloat. We wandered around the side of the cabin to find the hot tub, filled with green algae infested waters. A thick sludge had formed on the top of the water, thick enough for insects to crawl across it. So much for using the hot tub this summer. We finally gathered up the courage to enter the cabin. We took a breath, locked gazes briefly, and my father led the way. As soon as he opened the cabin door, we were hit with a gut-wrenching stink of body odor. The smell was so horrible and putrid that I had to step out of the cabin briefly to fill my lungs with breathable air. After a moment, whatever stink that was trapped within the cabin 
generally wafted out the door. We entered the cabin and opened all the windows for better air circulation. The entrance was actually the additional bedroom that was poorly constructed and attached to the original cabin. You opened the front door and you entered the room approximately 6 feet by 8 feet. Directly in the middle of the room was an old, ratted pull-out couch, one that pulls out into a bed, and an old desk lamp with a moth-eaten lampshade stood dangerously close to the edge of a worn antique table. Beyond the entrance was a living area that consisted of a small leather futon. That was basically a leather brick couch that unfolded into a leather brick bed. Another antique coffee table, a 32-inch flat-screen television with a broken screen, and a wood-burning furnace that was held in place with polyethylene foam. Yes, highly flammable foam. And as far as we could tell, that was the only heat source in the cabin, and it was still early summer. The nights were still cold. The kitchen was a disaster. Dirty dishes covered all space on the countertops, rotting food was left in the fridge, and a couple bags of frozen lake-cut perch were shoved into the back of the freezer. The stove still had a loaf of garlic bread in it from the last use, and above the cupboards was a stack of dusty Playboy magazines. The bathroom was as dirty as you could imagine, and smelled strongly of urine and mold. The shower and toilet lacked any kind of drainage system, and any water used in either would simply drop through a hole in the ground to the beach below. The beach where the man told us we could swim and dock the kayak. Finally, we entered the master bedroom. This was definitely the source of the foul stench. A single double-sized bed stood in the far corner of the room. It's formerly white mattress was stripped of any sheets, and the mattress itself was heavily stained with deep red, brown, and yellow stains. The carpet had similar stains around the bed, and the smell coming from the mattress was absolutely sickening. We opened the three windows that were in the decently sized bedroom, and closed and locked the door. We never entered it again. Feeling absolutely cheated and disgusted, my father and I decided to come up with a game plan. We had already driven the seven hours to get here, had already taken the time off work, and most importantly, had already paid for the two weeks in full, in cash. We were stuck here. We decided to take the car, very carefully, back into Bridgeview and stop at the convenience store to pick up some cleaning supplies, bleach especially, so we could at least make the cabin livable. We ended up spending five times the amount we would have from a general store, and spent the remaining six hours of the day cleaning the cabin from floor to ceiling. When we were finished, it actually looked pretty nice. The bedroom was condemned, but the kitchen was clean, and the beds were made with fresh sheets that, luckily, we had decided to bring from home. On the first night, I decided to sleep on the pull-out couch, because it was more comfortable than the futon. My father didn't argue, as he was never one to pick silly fights. We fell asleep early after an exhausting day of scrubbing until our fingernails bled. Around 4am that morning, I woke up to the motion light outside turning on. I figured a small animal must have run across the deck. Or maybe the wind had blown something around that was large enough to trip the sensor. After a minute, the light faded, and darkness enveloped me again. I was about to close my eyes when the light flickered on again. This time I was getting a little nervous. I lay in bed and pulled the covers over my head. I didn't want to turn the lights on. If someone was outside, they could easily see me through the windows. The light switched on and off three more times, before the darkness stayed with me until the sun chased it away in the morning. I laughed at myself in the morning thinking my mind had been playing tricks on me. When I finally got out of bed, my dad was sitting up on the futon. His eyes looked dark and red. He hadn't slept very well either, I realized. Did you see the lights? he asked me. It was so sudden, I had to ask him to repeat himself. The lights, the motion lights, did you see them come on last night? 
I nodded my head nervously, wondering why he was bringing this up. He said nothing else, just stared at the broken television. I shrugged it off as him not having had his morning coffee, and went to the kitchen to brew some. Nothing significant happened that day. We spent the day exploring the woods, and briefly testing out the kayak. It floated. We decided to put it to the real test tomorrow morning. That night, while my father and I were getting ready to go to bed, he brought my pillow and blanket from the pull-out couch and brought it to the futon. Can you sleep here tonight? He asked. I'm too old to lay on cement. That futon killed my back last night. I nodded without hesitation and handed him his pillow and blanket in exchange for my own. I thought nothing of it for the next few nights. That night, around 1 a.m., I woke to the motion sensor light flicking on. I lay awake with my eyes wide open. I could just barely make out the illumination of the light through the blinds behind me. I heard a faint tapping sound coming from the kitchen area. And then again, at the window behind my head. I froze and held my breath, listening. I heard nothing else. The light turned off after a moment. But I drifted back to sleep. At 3 a.m., I was awoken again. I thought I heard laughter coming from outside. I thought surely I had been dreaming, but as I turned my head, I realized that the motion light was, once again, rivaling against the moonlight. The light flicked off, and just as I was about to drift back to sleep, I heard it again. A definitely fucking laughing. Coming from the front deck, I stiffened in my blanket and strained my ears to listen to anything seemingly inaudible to the human ear. I heard it again, a distant laughing, and this time, footsteps. I heard slow and deliberate footsteps walking up the deck toward the front door. My initial reaction was fear, not for me, but for my father who was sleeping in the other room, a mere two or three feet away from the front door that someone, or something, was now standing at. I was paralyzed with fear, waiting to hear the sound of the screen being pushed aside, a bony hand reaching in through the mangled mesh, and then the soft click as the lock gave up its desperate hold on the door. I began to sob softly as I envisioned my father being attacked by a stranger at the door, never even knowing what was coming for him. I lay there and waited for what seemed like hours. Finally, the porch light turned off, and silence filled the gaps in the night. I didn't sleep a wink. The following day, I decided not to tell my father about what had happened. He had obviously slept through the entire event, and would surely think me mad if I had told him such a brother's grim tale. Instead, we spent the day exploring the last bit of the surrounding bush. What we found was unnerving. Tucked away, in behind two massive spruce trees, was a white and red rusted caravan. The doors hung open as if welcoming strangers into its death trap of shrouded metal and dust. The back window was smashed in with something heavy, a rock or a ball or a bat. As we drew nearer to the caravan, we concluded that it was obviously abandoned, and for quite some time. Tires lay flattened on bent aluminium rims, and greenery began to weave its way through the tarnished frame. Tucked into the center console, under what looked to be an abandoned squirrel nest, were three IDs. I recognized two of them immediately. They were the men who rented us the cabin. What were they doing out here? I would like to add, it took my father and I a good half hour to get to this location, and we bushwhacked the entire way. Us finding this was mere coincidence at best. Whoever put the vehicle there never intended for it to be found. We quickly threw the licenses onto the driver's seat and hurried back to the cabin. That night it rained. Hard. And we found out our cabin had multiple gaping holes in the roof, just behind the panelling, so dirty brown water seeped down the walls in torrents. The light remained off that night. The next three nights were also uneventful. On the following Friday, 
we decided to finally try out the kayak. It was a risk indeed, but one we were willing to take since we had already hiked around the cabin property multiple times. We decided we were going to cross the lake and tie off on the opposite shore and fish off the rocks that jutted out 15 feet from the shoreline. It took us a little over an hour to make it, and I noticed in the distance there was something hanging from a lonely tree, poking out at an awkward angle from a cliff face. We pulled the kayak on the shore and travelled the rocky shore to investigate. My heart dropped when we got close enough to see what it was. A dark, tattered noose hung from a broken tree branch, about ten feet in the air. The noose swung loosely over an array of sharp rocks and debris from passing fishermen. My blood turned to ice in my veins as I looked back to my father. His eyes were white, but he said nothing. He simply motioned us back to the kayak, and we returned to the cabin. We didn't speak the entire time. That night, the sounds on the deck were worse than before. I could distinctively hear a type of cackling in the distance, and the light turned on mere seconds after the timer plunged the deck back into darkness. This time, my dad could hear it too. I crept into his room to find him sitting upright in his bed, with the blankets pulled over his body to camouflage himself in the darkness. He was staring motionless at the door. I could see a shadow pass by the window as I walked back to my futon. I nearly pissed myself then and there. But my father and I have been through some terrifying experiences, and we can both handle our own. I wasn't going to panic unless he did. And now was not the time. I went back to bed and lay awake all night, listening to the constant tapping and laughing coming from the abyss beyond my windows. When morning came, my father and I finally passed out in our beds. We would spend the rest of our trip doing this, staying awake all night and sleeping all day. By Monday, we had had enough. We were ready to leave, take a loss, and give up our final few days at the cabin. We packed our bags and planned on leaving in the morning. That night it rained. Hard. So hard that it washed out the steep, winding road that led down the forest to the clearing. It had rained so hard, it had nearly caused erosion to drop the car backwards into the lake. We couldn't leave in the morning. We were stuck until the ground dried enough to attempt it with the car. We brought our bags back inside and awaited another terrifying night. That night was surprisingly quiet. The motion light remained off. The wind gently rustled the leaves and the branches above, and every once in a while you could hear a wave or two crash against the sandy shore. Around 2am the deck light came on, just once, and turned off in 30 seconds, and for the first time in days I closed my eyes and slept through the night. First thing in the morning my father roughly roused me by shaking my shoulders. He demanded that I pack up the things I had removed from my bags last night, because we were leaving, now. I never questioned my father, and he seemed almost panicked. So I did as I was told and packed my bags. He didn't talk to me for the entire seven hours it took us to drive home. I found it very odd. He and I usually took this opportunity to talk about life. It wasn't until after we got home that he told me why he had made us leave so abruptly that morning. He had said that the night's light kept turning on and off. He could hear laughter coming from the woods, and sometimes he could have sworn he heard footsteps. The first night it happened, my father woke up first thing in the morning and went to investigate around the cabin, hoping to find a clue as to what had been stalking around outside. He said all he found was a single pine cone, right in front of the door. Surprisingly, there weren't any pine trees immediately around the cabin, so this confused him, but a pine cone is innocent enough, and he kicked it off the porch and forgot it. That was until the next morning. He said that every night except for the night it rained, and the three nights it was quiet, he would go out in the morning and find a pine cone exactly where the one had been previously. He would always kick it off to the side of the deck and go on with his day. On the morning that we left, my dad said he had woken up at 6am because he felt like he had been watched. 
He looked around in a sleepy daze, and his heart jumped up into his throat when his eyes landed on his own blanket wrapped around him. Placed ever so gently and precisely in the very centre of my father's chest was a single pint cone. That trip was the last my father and I ever had. It has been seven years since this incident, and I still remember the fear it instilled within me. I didn't realise until years later, however, just how lucky I was to have my father there with me. He had heard the laughter in the footsteps, and the night he asked me to switch beds was because he had an uncomfortable feeling eating away at him. He would have rather been the one to sleep in front of the only entrance to the cabin, the only entrance that didn't lock. 2. So this happened when I was 15 years old. I was a really wild child, and one random Friday or Saturday night, my friend Josie had come over to my house. We had spent most of the afternoon in my front yard, doing gymnastics and shit, and while we were cartwheeling through the grass, this old rusty pickup drove past, slowing down as he got closer, the man in the truck turning to stare as he rolled by. Seriously, I remember watching it because people normally fly down the rural road I live on, not slow down. We joked that the man, a guy with a baseball cap on his face, was hidden by the shadow of it, save for a very long and scraggly grey beard, was obviously checking out our pubescent bodies, and quickly forgot about it. Later that night, we had made plans to sneak out of my house to see Josie's boyfriend. It was super easy to do. My dad's bedroom was on the opposite side of the house, so he wouldn't hear us. And my bedroom window was really tall and only about three to four feet off the ground, along with the fact that it had no screen, so sneaking out was easy as walking out the back door. We had gotten outside and we were walking around the front of my house to sit on the porch and wait for Josie's boyfriend to get us. When I noticed something in the cornfield across from my house, it looked like a rusty pickup truck, the windshield glinting slightly in the moonlight and the tiny light of what could have been a cell phone or camera lighting up the interior of the car, a scraggly beard barely visible in the glow. Immediately, my heart just sunk. It was most definitely the truck that had driven past us earlier, and it was sitting in the field facing my house. I nudged Josie and pointed it out to her, and we both pretended not to notice it. Maybe he was a farmer. We decided after a minute, or a guy getting ready to go hunting. We smoked a cigarette while we waited, and continued ignoring the truck, despite the fact that I could almost feel him staring. I had been keeping my eyes on the road, watching for Trent, when we both heard this horrible groaning sound coming from the field. The guy in the truck was opening his very creaky, squeaky door, climbing out of his truck. Let's just wait inside. I said as the man started walking towards the road towards us, his hands behind his back. Josie quickly agreed, and we made a mad dash back around my house, and I could hear the man starting to pick up the pace behind us, his shoes now crunching on the gravel road. Luckily I had left my bedroom window open, so we bolted through it, and I slammed it shut, locking it just as a shadowy figure appeared at the glass. I closed the curtains and Josie turned off my light, and we sat huddled in the dark as she texted her boyfriend what was going on. As we sat there, we heard him tap on the glass, scratchy noises like he was running his fingernails up and down. We both started crying, debating whether to call 911 or not. I didn't want to wake my dad up since Trent had called us in the meantime, saying he was only a minute away and would handle it burly redneck boys for the win, and dad would kill us if he had gone outside to find an intruder, only to have a random boy we invited over to join the ass kicking. After what seemed like forever, the sounds of tapping ahead turned into desperate scraping, as though he was trying to get his fingers under the wooden windowsill. Then headlights. Trent, who had snuck over to my house many a time before, had driven into my yard, his headlights lighting up my yard and the man standing at the window. There was no more scraping, and Trent's massive truck 
backed out the yard a second later. He called us to let us know that the guy had just bolted to his truck, which was confirmed as we heard the screeching of tires on the road a second later. And Josie and I cried with relief. At that point, I was too afraid to leave my house. So I let Josie out with her heroic bow. She froze when she climbed out the window, hands shaking as she reached down for something I couldn't see, her blonde hair hiding her hands. Holy shit, she whispered, holding something up for me to see. A fucking huge hunting knife. The tip bent slightly. At the bottom of my windowsill were deep gouge marks where he'd been trying to pry the window open. She climbed back inside, and Trent joined us, the three of us taking turns staying up till it was nearly daylight and Trent had to leave. We never heard from or saw Mr. Scragglybeard again, and I moved a couple years later, so the odds are we will never meet again. 3. When I was 14, I would spend the summer holidays away from school at home. In the small village I lived in, this meant I mainly spent my days on my own while my parents worked, watching TV and playing The Sims. My parents were generally out of the house from 8am until 5pm. I was raised to never answer the door to strangers. However, where I liked to sit in the living room, my chair was next to the window anyway, so I could always see people on the street. And they could see me too, I guess. One day I was sat watching daytime TV when I noticed a man walking down our street. As our street is a dead end, I normally recognize everyone who walks down it, but I had certainly never seen him before. He was tall, thin, and unshaven. He was wearing a hooded jumper, with the hood up and the sleeves rolled up, revealing tattoos on his arms. He was carrying a large duffel bag and looking closely at each house as he passed. As I sat watching him, I was clearly in full view of him too. He started to pass our house, and when he saw me, he smiled, and turned to come up our short drive. He came up to our front door and knocked. I knew I shouldn't answer the door to someone I didn't know, but he had seen me, and at 14, I was afraid of being rude to an adult. So I obediently went and opened the door a crack. I peeked around the door and said hello. As he spoke, he pulled the duffel bag around to the front of his body and asked me if my parents were home. At this point, I thought he would probably leave if I said no. But instead, he stepped towards the door and unzipped the bag. Well, the thing is, I've just got out of prison. I want to do the right thing, you know? So hard to find a job, so... I'm trying to sell some things. He started pulling towels, handkerchiefs, and other junk out of his bag. The word prison made my heart skip, and I quickly mumbled something about having no money and closed the door. He stood on the step for a minute, still talking to me about being able to help, so I went upstairs and waited for him to leave, which he did. I soon settled back down to watching the TV and forgot all about my encounter. At 5 p.m., my parents came home, and they took the TV, so I went up to my room. A little while later, there was a knock at the door. I came onto the landing and peered down as my mom answered. Two police officers were stood on the step. They asked if anyone had called at our house that day. My mom said no one had, and that was when I remembered my visitor from earlier. I came down the stairs and said that, actually, someone had called. Seeing I was young, the two police officers asked to come inside and talk to me. They asked me to describe the man and the conversation I had with him. They seemed really worried and kept telling me not to worry and to be honest about what had happened. Once I told them what had happened, they asked to speak to my parents on their own. And then they thanked me and left. I was straight on my parents asking what was going on. My mum explained that a few minutes after the guy had come to her house, he had gone to another girl's house. She was in the shower and hadn't answered the door when he knocked. Apparently, he let himself into the house and walked upstairs when he found her in the shower and sexually assaulted her. With my description and the evidence from the girl, they tracked the guy down. It turned out he had just been released from prison for a similar attack on another girl. 
I never answer the door when I am alone now. And I also won't shower when I am home alone. Hey everyone, Hello Freezer here, and thank you very much for listening to True Scary Stories, episode 84. It is a very happy Hell Freezer that greets you today. I just passed the 10,000 mark. Puts me about 10% of where I ultimately want to be. Really want that silver play button. Uh, well, let me think. Well, in celebration for hitting 10,000, I'm gonna start work right away on my new 30 story special. I've got enough stories for that now, so I can start working that any time. So I'm going to try and get that out within the next two weeks. I'm not going to kill myself at it, but get better results that way if I take my time. And that's pretty much what I'm going to go do right now. I'm going to start looking into what I need to do to get that together. So thank you so much for all your well wishes. Thank you so much for your comments that, that have gotten me this far. And to all my subscribers, both old and new, thank you so much for sticking with me. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.